Well, it's really fascinating. So let me try to summarize what I have heard from this panel and the questions that came to my mind, and it's actually a floodgate open, so mm. I'll try to form it on the fly. So we're talking about PIIs, right? So the question is, what is a PII? We talk about mapping process when we need to protect our data. But we're also talking about potentially derivative data that can be created based on records that are mandatory already stored somewhere. And by the way, we don't even know how this information can be created because today we may not have a tool, but tomorrow somebody might invent one. And I'm really fascinated by the topic raised by Shahar, which is biometrics, but biometrics at the behavioral level, right? And as we just discussed, yes, even by how you take your phone out of the pocket, you can create essentially your psychological and behavioral footprint and extract your DNA. So how do we tie together? What is PII? What is the mapping process? How do we create a mapping process that can actually provide us with data protection in the environment where derivative data can actually contain behavioral components that potentially allow somebody to predict our behavior, right? It's not just a sensitive information. It's ethical component that relates to how a behavioral model of ourself can be used to anticipate our movements. So I think we're moving away just from the question of data protection to protection of our persona, per se. So what does the panel think about it? Um, well, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Yuval here for demonstrating my point perfectly, mm -hmm. which I'll uh, use in my uh, next uh, lectures, because I think that we, we have a problem that we must address. And um, I'd like to, to add for the, for the audience that there, um, and, and in this form especially, there are two kinds of uh, reg um, basic, distinct kinds of regulation. There's command and control where the government or the, uh, uh, the state says, we want you to do this or you can, cannot do that. And we as policymakers do that as best we can, but we don't know the industry as well as you do. We don't always realize the operational implications. The other, the other kind of regulation is self-regulation, where you create the standards uh, in collaboration with, with privacy professionals and you create something that is suited for your needs and functionalities. So I think uh, that's the best way to go in this case, which is very complicated. Um, your question about PII, what is PII? Um, we have various tools in the privacy profession in order to identify and to uh, map processes. It's called a privacy impact assessment. This is something that you have, especially in the United States and also in Europe, and it's starting to be stronger in Israel. You have people who are trained to identify personally, personal information in organizations. For example, sometimes someone would ask me, I'm just sending an Excel sheet with names and addresses and phone numbers. This is just a phone book, it's not personal information. So my question would be, but do you have another um, um, invisible identifier for the group? Are these all people who are elderly? Are these all people who have low incomes? Are these pe all people who, who suffer from uh, diabetes? Then you have personally identifiable information inside your database. So that is one way to start thinking about PII. Uh, it's not always easy, uh, but you have to, to, to understand that the definition co uh, includes uh, identifiable information. So you need to start thinking, if I fuse this database with other databases that may be public, that may be uh, uh, in my organization in other places, will I then be able to identify the information and, and then, boom, I have PII. I have to address these questions. So um, I think I'll take a breather. And if you, there's anything else you want me to well, add, I'll do maybe that. I would like to ask a clarifying question. Based on what you just said and based on what we heard about as an example, behavioral imprint, right? It's very clear when you have a database, an Excel uh, spreadsheet, where you can actually identify concretely written data. But now we have a derivative data that gives us a behavioral imprint. Mm -hmm. And based on that imprint, we can essentially identify a group of people that is prone to be distracted, as an example, by music. Okay. 
Well, that can be used in certain circumstances against mm -hmm. them or mm -hmm. for them, right? Yeah, I, I think that would also qualify as, as long as you can uh, um, know something about me that um, implies my um, state of mind, my beliefs, my uh, character, my, 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 my lifestyle. Right. This is all private to me. And the basic idea of privacy is that we have a basic right to be let alone, that corporations and governments should not be let inside our private areas. And uh, once you go into that, you have to take that into consideration that this may be uh, uh, greatly used for good purposes, but it can also be used for, uh, for very bad purposes. Um, we have uh, a very interesting debate right now in the United States about uh, um, uh, claims being heard that uh, Google and Facebook are using their uh, uh, analytic capabilities in order to influence the elections. They are uh, uh, tampering with, uh, with uh, results, with search results, and with uh, uh, information that's being put out as news feeds in Facebook, and they're trying to manipulate the uh, elections. I'm not sure if this is allegedly, I don't, I'm not sure if this is what they're doing, but the potential is there, and it's very, it's very important for us as a democratic society to, to keep uh, watchdogs and to prevent that. And it's very important for us as, as people, as persons, to be able to do what we want in our private spheres. Right. But I think if we leave the names aside and put it all in the context of science fiction, it's very easy to imagine, right, that data and extraction of that type of uh, behavioral DNA can help somebody, okay, if you like, as an example, a sequence of certain numbers, so maybe the phone number of a candidate should contain those numbers mm -hmm. in text message, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's very easy to imagine something like that. And, and I think when we talk about the fact that we don't have tools today to attach them to the information, so we cannot actually control the usage and consumption and proliferation or dissemination of this information. We need to think about how to close that gap as well, mm -hmm. right? So what do you guys think? I'll, I'll go back to the question of uh, what is PII for a second. Um, in the 2013 elections in Israel, there was this system called a lot of, uh, bingo, which means that every uh, voting booth has uh, three people representing the public who sit and check people's ID before they come to vote. Now, one is a professional, he works for the government, and two are from uh, political parties who come to supervise. Now, these guys get a bingo chart and it has the numbers of the, the voters, not the ID number, just the voter number. Now, uh, a guy named Tomi Rashul, which is a, a PhD candidate now, and myself, we did a, a study and we uh, were able to deduce in small uh, voting polls uh, who voted for what just according to the time they voted. Because what happens is the supervisor goes and sees the stacks of uh, Vo uh, voting uh, notes and sees uh, how much were reduced and he can deduce according to the voting percentages in previous votes. Now this means that even uh, if you're the most anonymized person going into a booth behind a curtain and putting uh, your ballot in, someone can know what you voted just be, uh, because the height of the stack was changed. Uh, and if, for example, it's an ultra-Orthodox area and there's one voter who's secular, you can know who voted for what. Now, everything is PII, and that's how I, I see it. You go with the presumption that unless proven otherwise, all information you send has identifiable information. It's the list of apps you have on your device. It's your browser type. It's your screen resolution, uh, your free space on your hard drive. All of these can be used later on to personally identify you. Now, what you have to do is say, well, if I anonymize and aggregate this, let's say, for example, I can say that 70% of the people in Tel Aviv University are, then it's not PII anymore. But unless you aggregate this information or unless this information specifically relates to an immovable object like the height of a tree or, let's say, how much uh, electricity was consumed in a public area which is not inhabited by humans, then unless you're in these examples, most likely that 
that information is somewhat PII or maybe PII if combined with other information. So in other words, everything that was anonymized could be de-anonymized using derivative data from and different channels. Anything could be de-anonymized yeah. later on. Yeah. Well, I want to be the unpopular one here, but I want to say that... Uh, That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> no, it seems like you're in the right team here, but... Uh, on the biometric world, biometric is needed for identification, and biometric is who we are. And I would say that although that is much the, one of the most personal information you have, it's not personal because, guys, you're looking at me, and I just showed you myself, so you now know my biometrics. Okay, you know my height, you know how I look like. Oh, you didn't read my fingerprint, but that's also I'm showing outside and touching things around here. So I would say that biometrics as itself is not a personal information because I'm actually providing it everywhere and anywhere. And if I'm recording it something, it's not different than recording the videotape by that camera that could be turned into biometrics later. Connecting it to other information could be personal information, but the biometrics itself and the biometric world is just the key and the lock. I'm the key to other locks. I can open it. If somebody steals that information and does whatever you want with that, if that was done correctly, the way the biometrics is, and then keep my picture, then they can't do anything with it because they're stealing the, the lock that only I can open. That's what I'm claiming about privacy here. I just uh, want to connect uh, the two comments that both of you gave. If, for example, to authenticate myself in front of Facebook, I'm going to use my face, okay? And let's say that not only one picture, it's uh, some kind of several picture continuous uh, authentication, like, like we call it. Let's assume that then Facebook has an analytics that based on analyzing my face, they can derive which type of vitamin of drug I should take. And then they put me, when I enter to Facebook, an advertisement to take this drug. Now, as in a cyber attacker, what should I, I, I should do? Just wait. Wait to see which advertisement, uh, advertisement is being sent to you by Google, and then I can learn a lot about you. So by disclosing this information, which is not fixed, it's somehow dynamics. Because some people can look for the dynamics in my face. I can indirectly disclose a lot of information about myself. And in, usually this is what attackers are like, like to do. They like to try to get the information it is derived based on other information that you provided about yourself and not do the derivation by themselves. Very interesting point. Any other thoughts? Okay. I think uh, we should uh, not rely on uh, people, let's uh, say, accepting the privacy issue requirements for, or an of an application because as you say, nobody reads it, and it's impossible. I some, sometimes try to read it, and after a few minutes, I, I don't understand what they want from me, and I see I'm only 5% through the, the, whole, uh, the whole list. I think uh, some uh, re regulation should uh, have, uh, let's say, uh, building blocks that will uh, enable to uh, raise the level of uh, privacy, let's say, uh, um, and as, as you said, an application that will say, scan my uh, smartphone and tell uh, what's the uh, privacy status. Tell, uh, tell me, uh, scan my uh, PC and say, hey, once a month, once a day, you are uh, subject to this, this, this privacy breaches. Scan my smartphone and say which breaches uh, you're in. Say, like uh, you've already said, the, the um, uh, movement. So let's say have some... Uh, indication, no, you're using a smartphone, you have this, this, and this uh, breach. So, so, so the small guy whose data is all over, uh, running away all around, he could not have some indication of what's going on. For, this is from the uh, person, uh, person, and from the companies should uh, map the relevant company which, uh, uh, which uh, their breaches uh, allow the uh, this uh, privacy breach uh, to uh, give them, uh, to put them under tighter regulation and so uh, try to uh, improve the thing. But uh, I have three daughters, uh, teenagers, and I tell them privacy, you know, just to understand you're with your smartphone, everybody knows everything. I just try to give them a few small uh, laws, don't uh, upload to Instagram. A picture, if you upload a picture, know that everybody knows the picture. Everything you write in WhatsApp uh, or whatever, everybody knows it. So you just have to, I think it's a pretty well, of a lost game, just uh, 
try to minimize the damage as much as possible. Makes sense. So any other thoughts, comments? Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. I understand that you are living in some kind of transitional period of time because we're moving from a period where there were no computers and gaining information was very costly to something that is very easy to uh, collect information and so on. And I would like to ask the panels, on one side, if there's a, a possibility to make laws to enforce privacy, they should be given. But I think that we, according to what you said, it's very complicated to do that. By the way, if it's possible, you can just ask companies to do things that will prove the things that you need the information for and not to collect the information itself. And in that way, you'll have some kind of zero-knowledge uh, algorithm just to check things, for example, identity or belong to a group or not. On the other hand, if it's not possible to do, and the laws or the enforcement is not something that is applicable, we maybe should say, we raise our hands up and there's no privacy. And we should start to think of how it is to live in a world with no privacy. Okay? Just declare it. Okay. Uh, well, I think, uh, like in many cases, we need to combine efforts and we need to use all sorts of, of solutions. There are laws for privacy. There, as I said before, they are getting uh, stronger and more uh, um, adapt to this digital age. Uh, we have enforcement. I manage an enforcement department and we impose fines and other sanctions in order to make companies uh, um, uh, stop infringements of privacy laws. Uh, you, ho you also need to educate the public themselves uh, in order for them to be able to understand a little bit better of what they're doing. I know this may be a very difficult uh, cause, but it's still worthwhile. Um, and we, st we, we are also uh, working with organizations and trying to implement, uh, you know, you, you take it from all sides. You enforce and you publicize the sanctions and the enforcement in order to uh, uh, bring uh, awareness and uh, to deter from infringements. And at the same time, you give out uh, laws, standards, and instructions in order to make companies uh, behave better. I think this is why this occasion is very, this this uh, forum is very important because I, my, my main message for you today is that we all have a responsibility. We're all part of this community. Uh, we're not on different sides. We have a responsibility to ourselves, to our children. We can do this if we adopt standards uh, by self-regulating the, the, the community. I'm, for example, I'm very curious to know whether Apple collects uh, the fingerprints that people enroll in order to open their phone security. I haven't uh, read or heard anything about that yet, but we did see other uh, 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 incidents like with Google Buzz and with uh, Gmail. We have huge class actions being filed abroad in the United States and in Israel. Uh, class action is a, a civil form of enforcing uh, companies to, to behave differently. Uh, there was a recent uh, class action uh, towards Facebook in Israel for $400 million on invasions of privacy in, in Facebook. So uh, it's a combined effort. We do our enforcement as government. We try to, leg to legislate. We have to, you have to understand that, and, and I'm sa saying this as a lawyer, leg legislation is very uh, lengthy. It's like the turtle trying to catch up with a te technology which is running much faster. Um, there's also a principle in law that we try to make laws uh, technologically neutral because of this problem of catching, catching up with technology all the time. So we really rely on standards. There are various laws in Israel that uh, refer you to standards that are uh, either ISO standards or other criteria that you can uh, learn from and take. And, and what you do is you take the industry standard, you put it into law, and you say, you must comply with this industry standard. And the standard can change uh, uh, with reality, and it can be adapted to the new technologies. And this is also one of the things. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm really convinced privacy is not dead. 
I don't think we should give up the fight. <laughs> I think that uh, it's easy to say that because you look around and you see many people putting out uh, lots of information outside in ways that are different from the previous generation and the one before. But still, when you interview anyone, they, they would not want their personal uh, medical records displayed on, it, on the Internet. No one wants their bank account uh, for uh, information out there for everyone to see. You don't want your children's psychological evaluations being read by the entire co the population. So we have many things still to defend and protect in privacy, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm optimistic. <laughs> All right, let's do one more question. Gary, you were raising your hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, uh, was it? Just sitting here for an hour or two, even you know, a bunch of specialists learn a, a, a whole lot of things they may not have known. Um, are, are any of you aware of um, efforts to start that education as part of the school program? Right? You get sex education, uh, you get a whole uh, number of programs that are, let's call them extracurricular. Mm -hmm. You know, why not when you're 10 start having these discussions about? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, the trade-off between convenience and privacy, you know, what are the implications of some of the stuff that you mm -hmm. write online, it's mm -hmm. there forever, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. Is anyone looking at trying to inject yeah. that into yeah. the educational yeah. program? Uh, I'll start with two things. The first, both in Israel and the U.S., children under 13 have different privacy uh, rights, and actually Facebook and friends and Instagram and friends can't store any information about them. So theoretically, th they shouldn't be there. So theoretically speaking, uh, education sh should start only after 13. Now, in practice... Um, I volunteer at a nonprofit called Ishnav, People for Ethical Internet Use, and uh, we instruct children using soldiers uh, who are closer in age to the children in uh, um, early elementary school and high school, and we help them to know what happens when you store information. It's a part of our instruction, but it's a very short instruction. We get two hours tops a year with students and it's not mandatory. We go and we lobby to schools there. Now, uh, it, should it be mandatory? I don't think so. I think that schools should have the choice. You don't want to go and ruin an ultra-orthodox uh, school that has no connection to the internet and uh, let them know about this wonderful world. But uh, you should also Think about it that when you do that, there's, there are a lot of people who instruct and scare you and say the internet is dangerous, don't go there at all, and not instruct you on proper use and educated use. Well, I, I think there's, I, I'm familiar with many uh, um, uh, activities. The Ministry of Education in Israel has uh, a mandatory um, lessons that are uh, uh, being uh, given to children, I think, even from as, as young as uh, eight in schools. They have various programs uh, that are adapted to the ages and to the type of use that is relevant. There's uh, an appointment of a special uh, digital advisor in every school in Israel that has to uh, give out these uh, programs and also be a point of contact in cases of cyberbullying uh, problems at, uh, with, with the kids uh, online and address them in, an, in, in a fashion that is relevant to their uh, uh, age and, and environment. Uh, there is also, we at, uh, at my uh, organization have uh, created uh, online uh, games for children in, in, a, in a government uh, uh, site that is actually quite, quite well visited by children uh, that uh, uh, illustrates by way of, of uh, playing online games uh, the importance of privacy, the implications, the, uh, the, how the ad, ad works. Uh, uh, um, uh, uses information. In the United States and in many other countries, we also have that. I know that from colleagues of mine. The FTC has that, and the ICO in the UK have that. 
Um, there's also in the United States, you have COPA, that's the Children uh, Protection Act, and that requires if you're collecting inf private information from children, you must get uh, parental control first before you do that. So there, there are various things uh, um, that are being done in order to uh, educate the youth, and I think that's a good way to, to, go, to continue. Well, I think educating the youth is one element of it, right? But if we go back to presentation, Bo, as you made, it's also educating management. It's educating professionals. You know, as we're coming together from OT to IT sides, right, we need to understand what the implications are. So I think, Gary, the questions that you raised, education, maybe it is meritorious for us to consider a breakout today focused on elements of education when we talk about closing this gap between privacy and security as we go forward. Because you're right, the more, it, it takes time to create policies. Mm -hmm. But I think we don't understand entirely as it's evident from the discussion of this panel, right? The power of analytics, power of creating our digital imprint, our behavioral imprint, and what can be done today through the secondary data. So maybe it's something we should consider for later today. Well, uh, I'm aware uh, of a former detective, police detective, who uh, goes around uh, schools and gives yeah, a uh, two-hour lecture to parents or to Teach, uh, students and uh, parents, and there he uh, tells about uh, certain uh, issues, uh, fighting issues, cyber issues relating to uh, children, and uh, I think he does a good job, and I know that children are, it opens their eyes, because uh, until if a parent say, you know, hear a lecture by, a, it's with no, not something really happening behind the breach, then it doesn't uh, enter their mind. But when they hear real stories of what uh, bad guys did to uh, small children, it's, uh, it's fighting. I think it, uh, it does, the, it does the, the job. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. But this is a fascinating discussion. I really hope that we can take it into breakout sessions today and continue. So really, thank you for those amazing presentations and your thoughts. Great job. Thank you.